great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Paul Crowler from Lancaster University that has been visiting us now for a couple of days and that has been personal experiences, some of our, our aspects of the project. And we will now have an uh, international perspective of what we're trying to struggle with at Lund University and Sweden. Thank you. Thanks, Osa. Thank you. And thanks for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here, and it's an education uh, for me as well to get to know more about the, uh, the Swedish system uh, and the, what seem to be very much the common problems that uh, we, we face. So, uh, so thank you. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm uh, that. I'm also head of department uh, of Department of Educational uh, Research. Um, and we, why am I here? Well, I'm interested in change. Uh, some of you have mentioned my, one of my earlier books, Academics Responding to Change. I would describe myself as a policy sociologist, although uh, some sociologists have said to me, what, what's a policy sociologist? Uh, perhaps uh, me and a few others are, 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 are creating a new field there. What I'm interested in is the implementation of change, policy trajectories, and particularly looking at the ground level, in my case, or the MISO level. Uh, in other words, small work groups working together uh, and how they create uh, reality of a, of a certain sort, uh, create culture, if you like, although I'm, I'm increasingly getting a bit disturbed about that, uh, that term, uh, using uh, social practice theory based on activity theory and communities of practice theory and so on, but amending it a bit. Uh, to analyze that. And recently, I've become very interested in exactly the kinds of issues and problems that you're uh, addressing today, the te teaching and learning issues, enhancement of uh, learning, teaching, assessment, curriculum, and so on in, in universities, and particularly uh, education development, the training of teachers, and so on. We're working at Lancaster, a, a team of us, uh, on the Scottish Quality Enhancement uh, System, a new system which tries to move away from uh, audit, quality audit, towards uh, changing institutions to become um, enhancement-led. And, and uh, we're evaluating the Scottish uh, system there, which is quite an interesting thing. We're into the first year as they, as they the Scottish Funding Council, try to make the 20 Scottish universities uh, enhancement-led and to focus on teaching and learning more than they currently are. And some of the ideas I'll talk about today come from that. We've also done uh, an evaluation that's just coming to the end now, four or five years uh, of, of work on the learning and teaching support network uh, in the UK, which is a, a 24 subject centres based in universities in the UK, each of which is trying to enhance teaching and learning in its subject area. Uh, and there's one, there was one generic centre as well, based in York. All of that system is now changing, and we've got the Higher Education Academy, uh, which is integrating uh, those subject centres, and also integrating the Institute for Learning and Teaching in Higher Education, which was one of the few things I understood from uh, <laughs> earlier on this morning. And apologies, by the way, for the fact that I'm speaking in English. I, I now have six words of Swedish instead of the two that I started with this morning, so I'm, I'm learning. But, uh, so uh, you should have the paper in front of you. There is another paper uh, which answers the third of my questions. And my talk today is oriented around the first two of these questions. I haven't really got time to go into the third, but I've done the third as a separate paper, which could be discussed if you wanted to, uh, and so on. So I'm just talking about the first, the first two. Chet. <laughs> I'm using to mean compulsory higher education teacher training. So it's just a shorthand for com compulsory higher education teacher training, CHET, a, a new word I've just invented. Uh, okay. So is it a good idea? And what can experience theory and research tell us about the likely implementation process of uh, CHET? And then the third one about change and so on, which is what I've published about already. There is lots of material available. I've got a website with all my publications and reference, reference to lots of others. Where am I coming from uh, with this? Well, the research of others into education development in the UK and abroad. And I've got a PhD student who's just finishing her, her, her thesis. In fact, she'll be submitting it in two weeks' time. And she's tracked the process that you're going through in the UK. I mean, we're a bit further behind than you, I would say. 
but she's tracked it from the Deering Report in 1997, which reviewed higher education in the UK through to the stage it's at now. So she's been collecting data from, it's a policy trajectory study, so uh, she's been collecting data from key stakeholders, institutional leaders, uh, and education developers as well as students uh, on education development courses and a lot of a lot of very useful information there I'm sure that will be published and a bit in this paper and a lot in the paper that the other paper that you'll get uh, comes from her work that's Ronnie Bamber who's at uh, Harriet Watt uh, the research literature onto the implementation of policy, the kind of literature background, my department's own evaluation work that I've just mentioned, particularly on the LTSN, the Learning Teaching Support Network, and the Scottish uh, Quality Enhancement Strategy. The, the, in the UK, they're just implementing a new, a new system. I'll talk a bit about unjoined up policies in, 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 in about five minutes. Uh, a new system called, well, it used to be called Kettles, now they're called settles, and they're centres of excellence in teaching and learning. And these are going to sit alongside uh, the subject centres, so an extra thing. And we're hoping um, that uh, we'll be at least involved in the bidding to evaluate the, the, the centres of excellence in teaching and learning. There's 100 bids in for, to set up those centres, and something between 20 and, and 30 will, will win, and they'll be set up shortly. And as I said, my own, uh, I'm bringing to this my own application of social practice theory, uh, looking at work groups, uh, micro, micro sociological uh, uh, processes. Uh, I, I, there's a little bit of a health warning. You've got the paper. There's a health warning nearly at the end there. And uh, the health warning is there because I think some of what I'm going to say might be controversial for some of you. <laughs> I'm told that it might be, which is good. That's what keynote speakers should do, isn't it? Stir things up a bit and so on. Uh, maybe I'll get some questions at the end. But so what I'm saying really is I'm coming at this as an educational researcher, using the literature, using those things I've just mentioned. And uh, I'm not, I don't have an ax to grind. And I'm coming at it naive in terms of the politics of, of this, in particular, of course, the Swedish po uh, politics of it. So a little bit of a preamble about, about policy, first of all, before I get into the detail of, um, of uh, uh, the, the actual uh, thing itself. I'm told you recognize these people. <laughs> Uh, seen from a technical, rational point of view, a purely logical point of view, if you like, Chet is self-evidently a good idea. Train teachers, they'll teach better, things will, uh, things will improve. It's got to be better than uh, uh, things as they were to bring in compulsory uh, higher education uh, teacher training. Seems, uh, on the face of it, self-evidently a good thing. But as Stephen Ball, professor of sociology at uh, King's uh, College, a professor of education, educational sociology at King's College in London, tells us, policies are often the result of negotiation and bargaining, obfuscation, fudging, uh, sometimes deliberate, sometimes not deliberate. Texts, policy texts are created and they contain numerous points of view and the language sometimes elides those, those different points of view. Uh, Kogan tells us, Maurice Kogan, Professor Maurice Kogan, who's you know, one of the big names of higher education research, tells us that policies don't, re they're not really technical, rational in, in nature very often. They're incremental. There's a process of disjointed incrementalism that goes on. One thing builds on another. Uh, there's bargaining and conflict and so on. A policy is created. And uh, so what happens is a process of sedimentation uh, as, as policy grows. And it's not always a rational uh, building of one thing on another. I've got a quote in the, in the paper about that. Um, the, the, so policy at the national level, policy at the institutional level tends to be a bit fudgy, a bit like that. <laughs> I think that's, that program, well, the, the people who wrote that program were very well versed in the nature of Westminster and Whitehall politics. They, you know, they knew what they were talking about. Sorry, the, the one before. Um, second thing is very often the theory of change in, in um, uh, policies, particularly policies, I think, to do with improving teaching and learning um, in universities, are not very well thought out. Uh, things seem like a good idea, but the theory of change is a tacit one. 
and it's, it's, it's often not a very good one. Alan Skelton, for example, has done a review of, and I think you have something similar here in Sweden. In, in, in Britain, we have the National Teaching Fellowship uh, scheme where £50,000 is given to high quality teachers in higher education. There's a, big, there's a big thing in London and the minister comes along and so on. Uh, a big hoo-ha every year. Uh, there used to be 20 of these people. Now there, I think there are 50 of them. Um, but Skelton, who evaluated the NTFS, the National Teaching Fellowship Scheme, asked the question, what's the theory of change here? How will this change anything, really? And he's, he gets quite uh, aerated about uh, this issue. Will it really enhance teaching and learning, or will it just give these 50 people a nice 50,000 pounds for three or four years, no strings attached? They're nice if you get it, but how's it going to make fundamental change? So, one of the questions that I always like to ask is, what's the theory of change here? For example, about the Scottish quality enhancement thing. How is this going to happen? How will it work? How will institutions change from where they are now to be enhancement-led? And then you start asking different people that question, and you get different. They've got one. They haven't, usually haven't surfaced it. They've got a theory of change. It's not usually surfaced. But you find that you've got different answers. So the policymakers will give you different answers. The people actually doing the enhancement-led institutional reviews will give you different answers. The people on the ground will give you different answers and so on. So interesting. And the third thing to say about policies is they, they and it comes from the first really, they often have multiple purposes sort of elided together in a policy text. So you think you know what a policy is about, uh, but actually uh, it um, is about multiple things. And on page four of the handout, I won't read them out, I've, given, I've just pulled out four quotes from official documents um, f about what compulsory higher education teacher training chat is about in the UK. They're, they're very different uh, sorts of things. We're at the stage now, by the way, that um, a, uh, a consultation process is underway. The first phase of the consultation process about chat has just finished. Uh, which is about the structures and frameworks of it, and then a second phase will be coming in soon, which is about which is where, what you're talking about, the content and, and so on, the detail uh, of it. I mean, I think that's a depressing list of quotes there, isn't it, from the government? Uh, you know, to, to, to give, one of them is, says basically to give key stakeholders confidence in the quality of university education. Well, that's a pretty, pretty, uh, okay, it's important, but it's not, what I'd put down. Um, a fourth problem with policy in this area is about what's the best level of analysis to attack change, in, in our case, the enhancement of teaching and learning. Should we attack the, at the individual level, like the scheme I've just mentioned, the NTFS, the National Teaching Fellowship Scheme, one person or 50 people, different you know, individually, or education development courses, the one, the, the one person, although I do hear groups of people, which is nice, nice to hear, from one department coming to a course. Or the MISO level, the one that I'm interested in, the kind of micro-sociological uh, level, what happens there, or the institutional uh, level, the university. And if you look at policies orientated to improving, enhancing teaching and learning in the UK, you can see a kind of random, is apparently random, some policies here, some policies there, and so on. And actually, I have to say, and the quote is, is in the paper, that uh, the government in the UK has actually recognized uh, this, this problem uh, now in one of its, um, this is on page five, uh, I think. No, it isn't. It's in there somewhere. <laughs> okay, don't worry. Government's actually said, we haven't thought enough about the level of analysis and what the, you know, what the, if you like, the theory, the theory of what the appropriate level is for the theory of change uh, that we've got. And so, uh, one of the recent, the TQEF, Teaching Quality Enhancement Fund, has has quite deliberately approached the issue at multiple levels, uh, which is which is very nice to see. Uh, so we've had a kind of, uh, sorry, this, the slides are just for fun. 
a, a, Christmas, a Christmas tree model of policy. Shiny baubles, very appropriate for this time of year, isn't it? Shiny baubles, put, this is one of the, uh, the challenging, controversial bits maybe that uh, we'll have before. Shiny, this is, I'm talking about the UK now, I know, I know nothing about the Swedish. <laughs> Sure, it's not like this in Sweden. Shiny baubles put up temporarily, temp temporary effects, look great, uh, but not connected to each other, um, and so on. And, and maybe it's the government or the, the policy maker, whoever it is, saying, look, uh, we're doing something, uh, and it's great. So moving to the Swedish uh, case now, if you're following, I'm on page, page, page five. You can take your choice, read it, listen to me, do a bit of both. Look at the pictures. I'm told that <clears throat> here, uh, Sweden, uh, like nearly everywhere else in the rest of the world, is facing a fundamental change in higher education, massification, changing student preparedness, numbers of students increasing, and so on. And so it's felt that there's a need to address teacher, uh, teacher education. Um, uh, here as, as, as we're doing in the UK. So I want to just disaggregate my first question a bit into, into three sub-questions. What's the theory, leading on from what I've just been saying, what's the theory of change here? Is the thinking joined up? And will synergies be found uh, with what is already uh, in place? Now, the theory of change, certainly in the UK, is, again, from a technical rational point of view, looks pretty uh, straightforward set out on page six. Training all teachers in higher education will lead to conceptual and behavioral change among them. They'll change their ideas, they'll, they'll change their... The research shows us that people tend to move away from thinking about themselves. What am I going to do? What do I know as a teacher? You know, will, they, will they find me out? And gradually they move towards what do the students know and where can I take them and how can I um, encourage them? learning to occur. So there's conceptual change and obviously there's behavioral change uh, in, in what they do and how, how they do it and so on, improvement. And then that these conceptual and behavioral changes will lead to cultural change within the higher education system generally. So you fill, fill the, the place up with enough good teachers and, and the whole system will change. And so in the long term, <clears throat> we'll get better educational experiences uh, for, for students. So the, the final thing is that student learning uh, improves. And there's a quote there from Tom Borner at uh, Brighton uh, University, and he and colleagues did a, a, a study uh, of, uh, of that process. And that quote on page six pretty well sums up that theory of change. While you read it, I'll just get some water. So they looked at 50 institutions in England. And they're also saying what, what's interesting about the methods used on those education development courses in those 50 institutions is that they're nothing like the methods, the, the didactic methods, so the pedagogical methods, I should say, are nothing like uh, the ones generally used in those universities. They don't use lectures, for example, in education development courses. They don't use seminars. They use uh, the sorts of things you're probably uh, familiar with, lots of discussion, buzz groups, uh, resource-based learning, and so on. And Borner and colleagues say, well, that's great, because the education development courses, in a sense, are predicting the higher education of the future. They're student-led and student-centered, the education development courses, and that's where uh, the future of higher education uh, pedagogy should be, not in reproducing the disciplines or you know, lecturing about the disciplines and so on, but preparing students for portfolio careers, for a postmodern uh, world where they'll you know, need all, all sorts of different skills and they'll, they'll need to be um, uh, very competent individuals with, with good learning skills, ability to learn. So if that argument is correct, the Borner et al. argument and theory of, of change and development and so on is correct, then, uh, then Chet, both in Sweden and the UK, is, is, a, is a good idea. But 
Though there are some questions about that, and on page seven, I take another author uh, from Hong Kong Ho et al., that, that team, who suggests that it might not work. Uh, they wonder whether actually practices, concepts, of, uh, conceptions of teaching and learning and so on are so easily changed and so easily transferred into, into, into practice. So I'll just read this one out. As pointed out by some educationists, people I'm sure you know, Biggs and Ramsden and so on, many staff development programs work on the assumption that providing tertiary teachers with prescribed skills and teaching recipes will change their practices and thus improve their students' learning outcomes. However, the experience of many staff developers has suggested otherwise. In many cases, participants query the feasibility of the methods presented, defend the methods that are currently, they are currently using, the old lecture, seminar, and so on methods often, uh, use new methods mechanically or modify methods which are meant to facilitate student learning into a didactic, uh, they modify them into a didactic transmission mode, and didactic for, you know, for us would mean a very teacher-centered uh, mode. Uh, so, uh, the, there is an issue there about how far change actually occurs. And some of the work, going, moving to some of my work on social practice uh, theory, which I won't, I won't say much about here, but I've been working on the notion of teaching and learning regimes. Regimes rather than cultures uh, for, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, in other words, the idea that in departments or sub-departmental work groups that are engaged in a project for an extended period of time, people begin to see the world in, through spectacles. We all see the world through spectacles of one sort or another, but particular, if you like, cultural uh, spectacles. Identities are created, defended, attacked, and so on. There is, I don't like the word culture or communities of practice because of the notion of sharedness. There's some sharedness there, of course, but there's also a lot of tension, power, politics uh, going on. So there's more than just, uh, perhaps that's not a good metaphor, but there's more than just uh, spectacles. So there's internal diversity uh, going on. And I've elaborated this, this elsewhere, and we'll be writing uh, more about it. So, but what they do share, I think, is, a, is what you could call a backstory, a history. They've, they've been working, they, the work group, the department, have been working on a common project to do with teaching and learning, perhaps an undergraduate degree or whatever. Over time, they've developed sets of meanings, they've developed identities, they've developed power relations and so on, and they've got this backstory. So whatever the current issue is that they're dealing with, in common they have a history. Um, and a set of practices, see if you can guess the relevance of this. Uh, this is Icarus. If you don't, Icarus, apparently, you can't really see it, but Icarus has hit the sun and is, is falling into the water. So it's all happening in the background. Uh, but in the foreground, the practices are just going on <laughs> as, as normal. Um, so it's a, okay, it's just for fun. But I think there is something about that, that practices are very uh, difficult uh, to change. There's a nice metaphor about, about policy that, shows policymakers having a jug, uh, which is the policy, and they throw it down. And, but the for the people at the bottom who are going about their daily work, they see the, 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 the shards around them and, uh, and try to make, well, what's, what's, what's this? Particularly in a, in a situation where there are multiple initiatives uh, coming at them. Uh, so actually changing practices uh, is, is really quite, uh, quite difficult. So the question that I have really is, okay, if you take the individual level of analysis, if you train individual teachers and then expect major changes to occur in departments, well, maybe actually there isn't that much elbow room in, in the department for change and that the practices that happen regularly, they're unconsidered, repetitive, recurrent practices will uh, maybe, unfortunately, make it quite difficult to bring about uh, fundamental fundamental changes. <clears throat> uh, so there's a quote there on pages. Oh, no, sorry, your page numbers are different from mine, aren't they? I've just <laughs> realized. Ah, yes, because I've got a big version that I can see. Right, there's a, uh, under slide eight, Bruegel, if, if you've got that. 
Yes, my apologies. I thought there were a few confused uh, faces around. Perhaps I need a, where are they? I'll get the, yes, I did a bigger font so that I can actually see it. Yeah. Oh, it's not, oh, there are no page numbers on this one. Oh, right, okay, well. <laughs> Slide numbers will go for you, yeah. Okay, so Gibbs and Coffey then uh, conclude that the quote there, trainees reported that their departments, in their departments, teaching was often not valued and there was pressure to conform uh, to largely teacher-focused, not students-focused, teaching conventions, uh, such as lecturing and testing of acquisition of subject content. Change was sometimes frowned upon and taken to imply criticism of, criticism of more experienced uh, colleagues. The Gibbs and Coffey study, I, 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 you need somebody else here, Kirsten, how do you say her name, Lika, is it? Lika, Lika, and she's the specialist in this area of effects. Uh, but I, I, she and I were talking about uh, the studies of effects. She, she uses the word impact. It's not a word I like, actually, for reasons I'll talk about in a second. But we were talking about the um, studies of effects of education development courses, teacher, teacher, teacher training courses. And they're, they're, they're poor, really, those studies, methodologically poor. The most recent one that I could find is the Gibson Coffee thing. They did a preliminary... Um, a set of uh, results a few years ago, and the, the quotes final results have just come out 2004 in the journal Active Learning. But if you look at the methodology there, it's not that, not that great. So uh, I don't know how much we, we uh, can know about that uh, in terms of effects. Um, there are some problems too, in term, I think, in terms of the education development courses themselves, certainly in, uh, in the UK. Um, one argument is that they're insufficiently, uh, they insufficiently take into account disciplinary differences in teaching and learning. Now, what those disciplinary differences are, again, isn't very well studied. There's the Hativa and Marinkovic uh, collection from about 1995, and there was a uh, a, a series of studies done, I think, funded by the Carnegie uh, Center that was published two or three years ago. Clearly, there are uh, differences in teaching and learning approaches by, by discipline. And I tried to summarize what we know in the second edition of uh, Tony Beach's Academic Tribes and Territories that I, I worked on with him. So there's a bit of a section in there uh, trying to summarize uh, differences in disciplinary approaches. And, and, and we've tried to gather uh, from the learning and teaching support network uh, evaluation, which, as I say, is di divided by discipline, some of, the, some of those differences. But it's really hard to pin down. Uh, but clearly, uh, th there, th there needs to be more thinking, I think, in education development programs about disciplinary differences. I know there's an argument that says that we should mix disciplines and that there's a lot to be gained from mixing disciplines, and I'm sure that's true, but uh, there are disciplinary differences too. There's quite a, a critique also of um, the notion of the reflective practitioner. I have no idea how much that's used here in Sweden, but certainly in the UK, it is the dominant, it's the hegemonic uh, approach. We're, we're developing reflective uh, practitioners, but exactly what is meant by the reflective practitioner and exactly what one could expect from developing a number of reflective practitioners uh, is, is, I think, uh, open to uh, some, uh, some debate. Uh, I rather like the work of David Dill, um, the American uh, academic, who talks about the learning architecture of, um, of universities. And he, in uh, an article published, I think, in 1999, he talks about using examples from across the states. He talks about ha how uh, the systems and structures and procedures of universities can enhance or, or not um, learning and teaching in, in those universities. And he, he gives a very nice uh, set of uh, guidelines, really, for the establishment of um, a learning architecture in, uh, in um, institutions. So 
on the one side, you've got the theory of the learning architecture that says that institutions need to be set up in particular ways. On the other side, you've got the idea of the reflective practitioner, which basically says if you fill an institution with enough reflective practitioners, it will be an enhancement-led institution, a sort of size thing. And underneath that, there's Lewis Elton talks about uh, where there's death, there's hope. I think it's a lovely phrase. <laughs> Uh, in other words, you wait for the old guard with their old practices to die and, you know, the, the new lot. Uh, where there's death, there's hope. What a lovely phrase. But I think that's completely wrong. And he, said, he thinks so too. Elton thinks so too. Uh, because the structures and practices, in a sense, are separate from people. The people may die over time, uh, but the structures and practices are, uh, have, have uh, longevity. Um, so there's the problem of methodological individualism that's in, in, imbued in the idea of the reflective practitioner. It's the, it's the level thing that I, I, I talked about uh, before. We shouldn't expect interventions at the level of the individual to make, necessarily anyway, to make changes uh, at higher levels of analysis in any, in any reliable way. So I think, just to skip a bit, my conclusion from the first question, is, is it a good idea, is Chet a good idea, is, well, yes, it's a good idea. I don't want to throw it out um, at all. Uh, that's, not, uh, that's not what I'm about. And I'll read out the sentence, the paragraph that says this, because I want to be quite clear about it. My argument is not that we should throw out the idea of Chet, merely that it needs to be supplemented in a joined-up way with other resources, structures, and processes that are already in place uh, or need to be developed. Uh, so we need to think, oh, ah, I missed that one. Yeah. <laughs> That's about the best I could do for the reflective practitioner, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's not easy to find an interesting thing to describe the reflective practitioner. So we, and that's pathetic, but uh, we need a learning architecture. I was looking for something a bit more uh, elaborate. But I think I would add to Dill's idea of a learning architecture uh, the idea, too, of an enhancement culture. I think it's, it's, you know, yes, we need structures, processes, and systems in universities. We need to think about our committee structures and how we uh, identify problems, because a, a learning architecture is about the identification of problems and how they're addressed, and they're about closing the loop between seeing the problems and changing, changing practices and so on. But we also need an enhancement culture uh, where people are kind of aware and together in, in their work groups um, uh, are, are ready to review practice. And, I, I, you know, I've said the practices tend to be ingrained, the Bruegel thing. Uh, so ready to look at their tacit knowledge, look at their unconsidered sets of assumptions, unconsidered practices, and consider them. Bring implicit theories out and make them explicit uh, and, and so on. And we need to find ways to attack the teaching and learning regimes, attack in a nice sense, and make them explicit and, and so on. So, and as well as that, and I'm under different games now. There we go. I'm regretting these slides already now. That I'm <laughs> Universities play different games. I mean, I don't need to tell you this. Uh, they play a research game. Uh, particularly in the UK where we have the research assessment exercise once every five years. We're just coming towards our next one and suddenly we have to focus there and the money, our money depends on winning at that game. We play the teaching quality game, the enhancement game. We, we play the, the, uh, what we call the third leg game or the third mission game of, of income generation and so on. Those games have different rules, different goals, and they're not necessarily congruent uh, with each other. So there is the question, too, of aligning uh, policies uh, and priorities uh, and, and thinking carefully about the different games and the ways in which they, um, there can be synergies between them, uh, but also the, the contradictions. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but what I notice is, depending on which committee I happen to be sitting in that day, the game, the one game is in the foreground always, and it's really hard to, to remember the other games. So you can talk about, I don't know, somebody's teaching or something, and but you forget about the research game, which is some contradictory thing going on, and then you go to another committee and it switches 
uh, it switches again. And of course, there's the, the class, as well as learning a learning architecture and an enhancement culture and thinking about the different priorities, etc. There's uh, the, the simple stuff, in a way, that Cherich and Sabatier, in their classic study, Great, uh, Great Expectations and Mixed Performance from the 80s, told us about the fact that you need good resources. And I'll come to that in a second. Uh, that you need to be clear in your policies and their aims and the theory of change. That you shouldn't shift priorities halfway through and, and so on. We, we, that's more obvious kind of stuff about uh, the underpinning uh, resources. OK, question two. And I'm not going to go on for an hour and a half. Uh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll race through this, uh, because I do want uh, some time for questions. What can experience theory and research teachers about the likely implementation of uh, CHET? Well, there's, there's a bit of a a thing at the moment in the UK for evidence-based practice imported from uh, me medicine. And I would argue that that tends to uh, omit or occlude uh, professional judgment. It's Schoen's argument, isn't it, about, uh, about the reflective practitioner, you know, that actually professional judgment is really important and there are no one-size-fits-all uh, solutions in a, in, a, in a mechanistic kind of this is what you do in this situation. Uh, kind of way. So, and, and, and certainly the social practice theory would tell us that people create their own and different realities in different contexts, and those realities have very significant implications for the way that um, uh, policies are received, understood, put into practice, and what works in one place won't necessarily work in another place. And one of the, one of the, one of the principles that the 24 subject centres uh, tend to like and use is the notion of brokerage, where they sit up here, the, the subject centre uh, charged with improving teaching and learning in that particular discipline, and they would say, oh, they're doing X in university Y. Uh, let's tell university Z about, about practice X, and we'll just broker uh, the practice. But I think there's a problem uh, with that. And I was talking on, on Friday about the notion of reinventing the wheel. I think reinventing the wheel is a damn good thing to do, actually. It's not a problem. Because if you reinvent the wheel, it's your wheel. And it's a wheel that uh, is appropriate for your place. It's a, OK, it's a wheel, but it's a bit different from that other wheel. Um, so what can Nor the Norwegian experience tell us? And again, I'm, I'm, I'm benefiting here from uh, Kirsten Lücke, thank you, her work. Um, we've been in correspondence and she's, uh, uh, ooh. Thank you. <laughs> Let's switch that off for a second. Been telling me about the Norwegian experience because they've, they've now implemented CHET and they've had it for since 1988, I think it is. So there's, there's quite an experience there. And I won't describe the Norwegian system, and you, you may know it uh, very well, but it's in the, it's in the paper, a brief uh, summary taken from Kirsten's uh, work. What I'm interested in is not the description of the system, but the experience of implementing it. And uh, so first of all is, was the opposition to the idea of, of Chet. Uh, and where it came from, the Commit Committee for Educational Matters, there was a question about, you know, what right are they? Who should be imposing rules about uh, teacher education, compulsory teacher education? Have they got the right uh, to do that? But it was pretty clear, at least from Kirsten's account, that uh, think, you know, something needed to be done, that teaching competence wasn't being taken into account at all, and people could be promoted and get to quite senior positions without being good teachers. Uh, so something did need to be done. There was a, a, a certain amount of inertia at the institutional level, and the whole thing's taken quite a long time to actually get into place uh, uh, there. Um, and you know, certainly I would expect that to be the case, for inertia to, to, uh, to, to happen, and certainly in particular places. Some places will move faster than others. Other places will be slow. The implementation... Yes? Is it... Okay, I'll try and speak a bit louder. Yep. Sorry. Mm -hmm. 
the, the trajectory was very mixed as well, the trajectory of the, of the, uh, of, of the implementation uh, of, uh, of that policy, of the CHET policy in Norway. So some departments, some faculties, and there's an interesting disciplinary difference here, I think, or different, uh, disciplinary uh, dimension here, implemented it uh, quite quickly and you know, uh, to, to, to good effect. Others resisted or simply tried to ignore uh, the policy, hoping that it would go away uh, in the end. Of course, it didn't. Um, then there was the practical problem, the kind of Cherich and Sabatier resources problem. Uh, suddenly institutions that didn't have the resources, hadn't had education development courses on any scale at least, now suddenly they were supposed to do compulsory, compulsory for new staff uh, these courses and they just didn't have the capacity, they didn't have the staff, they didn't have the time and so on. So course capacity was a problem. Fifth, uh, there was uh, the question of from, some resistance. Is it worth it? Why do we want to spend our time on this when we've got all these other games to play? Research is our priority or you know, something else is our priority. And different stakeholders, sixth, took different uh, points of view. The top teams in Norway, you know, the, the president and, and, and so on, uh, tended to be in favor. Students generally in favor. Lecturers mixed, partly depending on how experienced they were, or whether they were new lecturers. But even the new lecturers, who in principle were in favor, are busy people. They're doing everything for the first time. They've got it, and often they get dumped with stuff that, uh, in the UK at least, that the older people defending themselves, the professors, etc., uh, stay away from. Uh, so even though the new people wanted to be involved, they just didn't have the time to uh, be involved. The response of the lecturers' unions, uh, union in Norway, tended to be in, eventually in favor. In the UK, it's, it's mixed. Uh, we, there are two unions involved, and uh, they're mixed between the unions and mixed at different levels of the union as well in the response to, uh, to chat. And still, we don't really know. about the effects. Kirsten, who studied it, says, nice phrase, the quality of teaching is by itself a difficult animal to catch alive and measure. <laughs> is it really, is Chet in Norway really improving the quality of teaching? Difficult to catch that one alive and to measure it. And an even more difficult question is, even if the quality of teaching has been improved, has that led to an improvement in the quality of learning in the students? That's even harder to uh, research. So poor old uh, Gibbs and Coffee uh, and, and uh, everybody else trying to desperately to catch that animal or those two animals, the quality of teaching and the effect on learning. Uh, it's a tough one. Um, there are you know, more robust studies of little things like mentoring, the effectiveness of mentoring or the effectiveness of workshops and so on. You can get down to that level and, and have quite robust research designs there. But bigger questions about CHET or about education development courses and about student learning are much harder to uh, tackle. Um, moving to the English experience, I think you can see three distinct phases. And from what little I got from this morning, with the help of a bit of simultaneous translation, I think it, some of it might be, might, might be quite uh, relevant uh, to you. The first phase was an attempt by what was the Booth Committee. Uh, Clive Booth was the, uh, was the chair uh, of it. Uh, to introduce 24 competencies. That would be the standard thing that all new lecturers would have to uh, achieve. So it's a competence-based model. Now, I'm told that you don't have this problem in Sweden, but in the UK, the competence-based model is a, is, a, is a disaster, has been a dis disaster since 1986 with the setting up of the National Council for Vocational Qualifications, which introduced a very... Uh, mechanistic, I would say, uh, competence-based model for the training of electricians and plumbers and so on. And, and people said that that competence-based model forgets about the brain. It just looks at practice, behavior. And so the danger is you get plumbers trained in a competence-based model 
who know what to do, but don't understand what, what they're doing or why they're doing it. And if they meet a problem, they can't solve it. They can, they've achieved the competence. So that competence for us is a bit of a pejorative word in, in the UK. These 24 competences were put out by the Booth Committee, and there was uproar amongst the whole community. There was a, a revolution uh, about it. What are these things? Why these competences? What right has this committee to say this and not that? And so on. So uh, a whole, uh, you know, the, the community was just not going to have th that competence-based uh, model, particularly when they'd been thinking along the Schoen reflective practitioner lines, which is completely the opposite, of course, of, of uh, this mechanist what we saw as a mechanistic uh, thing. So what's distinctively higher education about these? These could be the competences of a primary school teacher. And if you looked at them, there, 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 was, you know, there was nothing uh, in there that was distinctively higher education. Where are the subject disciplines in these competences? They, they weren't there and so on. So uh, quite quickly, those were withdrawn. And the Booth Committee, I think, went away with its tail between its legs a bit. <clears throat> and there was a, a, a move back to the default position, which was the series of uh, outcomes and underlying values and principles uh, from, the, uh, from CEDA, the Staff and Education Development Association, which had been used uh, for quite some time. Um, so, and that's the position we have at the moment, the CEDA uh, uh, approach, which is based on, uh, on the um, uh, reflective practitioner uh, viewpoint. But there is, a, as I say, the third phase is the consultation that's going on uh, right now. But I, my guess is they won't move very far away from the CEDA uh, model of outcomes and the underlying values and principles uh, that underpin them, because those have got, have got some kind of hegemony uh, and acceptance. But uh, to move over to, finally to Ronnie Bamber's study, the, the uh, PhD student I was talking about, she's been doing this policy trajectory study of, of the, of the uh, implementation of the Deering proposals from 1997 to have to train to do what you're doing, to, to have Chet uh, to the present day. Um, and the series of bullet points uh, towards the end of the, of the, uh, of the paper, um, summarise what she found uh, in the UK. So that most presti that more, the more prestigious universities uh, did, didn't and don't have uh, practices in place and management procedures in place to implement uh, some of the proposals. They're more loosely coupled than the uh, newer institutions, which have, are more kind of managerialist and can make things happen more uh, in more directly, uh, although with, with problems. Um, again, like Norway, the leaders of institutions that she interviewed tended to be very much in favor of, of Chet. Um, but some, while some gave real support, the resources that I talked about, others were just giving rhetorical uh, support with no additional resources. Heads of department were more circumspect than the top teams, perhaps because they, the heads of department, you know, face these multiple games in a more kind of day-to-day -day, uh, way. Some were very much in favor, some were against, some you know, do, did what they could but had to prioritize, say, research or whatever. Some uh, heads of department did hamper the implementation of, of CHET and, and continue to do so. They certainly have the power uh, to do that. As in Norway, the, similar is, uh, the, the, the story is very similar in both countries. New academic staff mixed in their support, in principle in favor of being trained, of uh, engaging with education development courses, but in practice so busy and worn down very quickly by the, by the multiple demands on them uh, that uh, it was hard for them to engage fully. So Bamba concludes, the devil is in the detail. Rather than uniformity of provision, the diversity of values and purposes in different types of institutions is reflected in a diversity of attitudes and approaches to training. The size of the course, the levels of support among senior managers, heads of department, and among new lecturers themselves. Um, and that's very much what one would, one would expect from a social practice uh, point of view. Um, and, and that there was, as I said before, only limited 
elbow room. Hmm, what's that? Missed that one. <laughs> yes, only limited elbow room. That's the, the, the other one was the refraction of policy <laughs> uh, for change via individuals. Uh, oh, it's the wrong way around. That's why. Yes, it should be the, the elbow room and then the prism. Yeah. Uh, so the, the policy will be refracted according to the culture and nature of the and priorities of, of, of particular institutions. Um, so just to conclude then in a, in a sentence, I would say, as I said before, yes, it's a good idea, but don't, don't, you know, the lesson I think is don't expect too much too quickly from it, and don't forget the level of analysis issue, the importance of learning architectures and enhancement cultures uh, in, at the institutional level to support pushes to enhance teaching and learning, generally speaking. Thank you. interesting and what's provoking presentation. I'm sure there's a lot of comments and questions to make, please. <laughs> and please introduce yourself to the others by you. Okay, so, uh, I'm Paul from the <clears throat> My question refers to the problem or the phenomenon with the disciplinary differences. Uh, because in the book, Tribes and Territories, you write about, uh, well, you discuss things around communication in academic environments, and, mm. and you talk about a large network mm. who teachers re or academics refer to large networks of several hundreds of uh, people involved in, but they, mm. they tend to test their ideas and develop new ideas in very small networks, mm. compile of, for instance, seven, eight, nine people mm. only. Mm. Mm. Uh, so that's one way of looking at the other way, as it seems to me, is the disciplinary way of see, looking for networks. Mm -hmm. And these two, not always, are the same. Mm -hmm. I, I guess you can find these smaller networks with people in different subject areas. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't it be, wouldn't the slice be made sort of in that direction instead of in the direction of the disciplinary differences? Mm -hmm. uh, I just would like to make a comment <laughs> on that. Yes, thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, it, I, I faced a very interesting task in, I was asked by the publishers of Academic Tribes and Territories, Tony Beecher uh, uh, was, was keen for there to be a second edition, um, and uh, we, we decided, Tony and uh, myself and the publishers, uh, to do, uh, to, for me to help with a second edition. I'd already been quite critical of the Tribes and Territories thesis in print uh, for a number of reasons and the methodology underpinning it. For example, there's a trickle down, if you've read the first edition, there's a trickle down theory, which basically says what, what top level professors do in Stanford today, uh, the le less elite uh, lecturers will do in a community college in Oakland uh, tomorrow. I don't think so uh, <laughs> at all. As, and, and the whole epistemological essentialist thesis of the tribes and territories argument, I had some problems uh, with the idea that the structure, the epistemological structure of a discipline conditions, even determines, which in the strong form you, you see that said, not only by Tony Beecher, but by Burton Clark and others, uh, I think is, is, uh, is, is too strongly stated. And unfortunately, you, in, the, in the literature on teaching and learning practices, we still see that strong version of epistemological essentialism being articulated. For example, some of the work by Ruth Newman and others published recently takes the tribes and territories, soft, hard, pure applied thing and says, well, this, you know, soft applied disciplines use these kinds of uh, practices in their teaching and learning and, and so on. There's all, a, a lot of problems with, with that. So for me, the, yes, the slice, the important slice, despite the fact that I worked on the second edition of that book, and you, you hear my voice, I think, coming through saying, well, um, the important slice is the work groups, but that narratives about discipline, narratives about disciplines, not necessarily the structure of the epistemological character of them, 
uh, but narratives about disciplines are important. And those work groups are open systems. They're natural open systems. And one of the things that flow into them is narratives about disciplines that are more structural in nature. So I wouldn't rule it out. It's just that I think the focus, as you say, the slice should be there, but that disciplines uh, continue, or narratives about disciplines continue to have significance. So the LTSN, the Learning and Teaching Support Network, with the 24 subject centers, they, one of the questions they asked us as evaluators was, are we right to tackle this from a disciplinary perspective? And the answer we gave them from our evaluation was, yes, you are, because narratives about disciplines are important to lecturers. And they see themselves as biologists or economists or whatever. Whether there are real differences in the teaching and learning practices across the disciplines, in a sense, doesn't matter too much. We don't think there are that, that many, <laughs> actually. But it's the narratives that are important. And so you were right to take a disciplinary perspective. And there's an interesting tension, and I'll have to be careful what I say because I'm being recorded, but uh, there's a, there's a, the, in the Higher Education Academy, which integrates the ILTHE, the Institute of Learning and Teaching at Higher Education, and the LTSN, Learning and Teaching Support Networks, there's a, a bit of tension, let me say, between, between them. And one, the, the LTSN says, oh, they're too generic. You know, they're taking a generic view the ILT, which doesn't so much distinguish between disciplines, and the ILT people will turn to the subject center people and say, well, they're, divi they're too fractured and divided and so on. So there's a, there's a, this, this question turns into a political uh, question. So how the, how the academy deals with that will be a very interesting thing uh, to see. I mean, Paul Ramsden, the director, is clearly aware of the issue. <laughs> your experience and or what's the Norwegian experience in terms of, of if you can really make a change within the framework of the teacher excellence, teacher's expertise and teachers doing scholarship. Do you, do you really change teachers towards reading the science of pedagogy at all? <laughs> you know? Well, I can't speak for Norway. You'd need Kirsten here uh, for that level of detail, but it's an interesting question. Uh, the, um, the experience, I would say, in the UK, uh, and I know that the scholarship of learning at the, uh, the SOTL conference organized by, by Vanita D'Andrea and so on, colleagues, happens every year. Uh, but I would say there's a certain amount of resistance amongst lecturers to that. Uh, certainly at Lancaster, if I base it in the Lancaster experience, what lecturers say is we don't want to become educational researchers. Uh, and they resist that in the UK quite, quite strongly. Um, whereas the education developers, I think, want to, be, want to turn towards what they often call an inquiry-led approach uh, to it. One of the tasks that we had to do, so there's a, the tension, I think, between what the developers want and what the lecturer, how far the lecturers being trained, want, want to go down that road. One of the tasks that we, the evaluation team at uh, my department, were asked to do by the LTSN right at the beginning was to look at their, their baseline statements about the state of the discipline uh, in the country. And the idea was that uh, the 24 subject centers and the one generic center had just been set up. They would, they would review the state of teaching and learning in the discipline uh, at the moment, and this was, I'm talking about three or four years ago, write a, a, a statement about it, and, uh, quite a long thing, and then they would review their, how things had changed and maybe try to look at the impact they'd had on that over time. And, and our job uh, in the team was to, was to take all of these 24 documents, the, the generic center didn't do one, and to analyze uh, the key issues that were coming out of those documents. And one of the, one of the uh, uh, we had a taxonomy that we used, and one of them was pedagogical research. And it was interesting, very few of the subject centers talked at all about pedagogical research in the discipline. One or two did, usually just a comment or two. It wasn't in the consciousness at all 
uh, of the discipline. And I think there's a good reason for that, and that is that the research assessment exercise in the UK doesn't count, or at least didn't count, pedagogical research. So you got no value for it at all. Uh, they're looking at that now. Uh, 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 as the Learning and Teaching Support Network moves into the academy, a similar sort of exercise has just been completed, and we've been involved in collecting data from a number of sources, including roundtable discussions and so on, about the state now. And pedagogical research is much higher up the agenda in the consciousness, at least, of the subject centers and in their perception of what's going on. Um, but that's been how that's come around, whether it's been through education development courses uh, or whether it's been a shift in the, at least the rhetoric about the research assessment exercise, I, I, I don't know. But I know that Paul Lamston is very, uh, the director of the academy, is very keen to, to uh, emphasize that trend. Yeah. Uh, Michael Christie from Shamans. The third wise monkey on the wall here. <laughs> uh, you talked a lot in your paper about theory of change. Uh, I think you quoted Skelton criticizing the teaching of woods. Uh, do any of the theorists talk about a theory of change for the better? And my question relates to Holmes' criticism and the criticism of a lot of teachers when they're confronted with us urging change, they want to know it's going to be the yeah, it's, a very, it's a very good question. Thank you for asking it. it did, the theories of change and the literature on change does tend to concentrate. The case studies are often the disasters and the things that didn't work and so on. Yeah, you're right. And I looked, uh, I've looked, I've asked that question of myself and I've looked for positive examples. And I can point to Lewis Elton's work. Uh, in that area. He, he did some work for the generic center of the LTSN, the Learning Teaching Support Network, the one in York. And there's a paper that's on the web uh, by Lewis Elton uh, that's, that's quite interesting that analyzes success, gives some case studies of successful change, and asks, the quest, asks your question. And basically what he says is the examples he, he chooses, uh, or at least that I've taken from him, I think there are other ones in there, are problem-based learning and, um, what's the other one? Well, let's take let, yeah, project work, that's right, yes. But uh, problem-based learning in, in medical profession and project work, generally speaking, what he says is that problem-based learning in, in, the medi in medical education, if you analyze it, took off because it, it was congruent with the practices in the discipline already. You know, med med medical people do problem-based learning. They take a history, they make a diagnosis on the evidence of the, the facts and so on. So there's, there's a certain amount of congruence between the pre-existing situation and, uh, and the, new, um, the new thing that's being implemented. And I think that's a very useful uh, paper. In the work that I did with colleagues called Change Thinking, Change Practices, which is also available on the web, uh, I, I give the example there of, um, oh, am I, do I need to s stop for a second? You asked me to, no, okay. Um, of uh, the credit framework in, in the UK, which was an amazingly successful change. I think you, you have it here, kind of American system of the um, assignment of credit value to assessed learning, so you get credits uh, and you can exchange them and, and so on, the, the ECTIS. Uh, system is a similar thing. Uh, so we moved away very quickly, or many institutions moved from a term-based thing with final exams towards a modular, credit-based, uh, fr lots of franchising, accreditation of prior experiential learning, a whole constellation of behaviors, practices uh, to do with, you know, based on the assignment of, of credit value to assess learning. An incredible change, and also in some quite prestigious universities that you might think would be quite resistant. And what, what was the reason for that success? Well, you know, it's hard to say definitely, but for me, one of the reasons was it was, it was a low fidelity change. And by that I mean it was, there was an aim there, but people could read into it and apply it in, in different ways. So that, uh, for example, from a student-centered perspective, if that's your ideological viewpoint. You could think about students choosing modules, developing their own program, and so on. 
So for somebody from that ideological standpoint, it was attractive. For managers, for university managers, it was attractive because it appeared to break down the academic tribes and to give them some control. Uh, it seemed to be economical as well. Uh, for somebody who, was, who came from what I call an enterprise ideological perspective, it enabled uh, <laughs> students to choose things that were appropriate to the postmodern economy. They could do French and business and become, uh, you know, uh, go to France and, and, and be involved in the business world or whatever, uh, as opposed to a disciplinary uh, perspective. So, so in, that, in that paper and in Elton's paper, there are some examples and some analysis of what of the conditions of success, if you like. Yeah. Hello, Celia, from New Jersey. Uh, I was thinking about the, the focus here is teacher training. And uh, thinking about your Christmas tree and the album, <laughs> this, I was thinking about, did you look into training of head of departments, head of schools, <laughs> about higher education? <laughs> yes. Uh, we did. Um, Peter Knight and I, people say to me, oh, we use your book. Uh, well, I've written more than one. Um, and, and one of them is uh, called, um, I've forgotten what it's called. <laughs> well, it's a book about higher education uh, heads of departments. Yes, it's gone completely out of my head. How strange is that? It was published in about 2001, I think. Uh, and what we did was a web-based inquiry I wouldn't call it research, into um, heads of department and their experiences and their train, how they were trained and so on. And what we were interested in was using so social practice theory. One would predict that actually what works for a head of department in terms of you know, their practices and their skills and so on in one context may not work in another context. I mentioned it uh, before. And the thinking about that also came out of a thing at Lancaster University called the New Managerialism Project, which was a big funded project that we did about, about this question uh, some, some time ago. Rosemary Dean and Stephen Watson and, and others were involved with that, uh, not me. Um, and uh, so we asked heads of departments around the world to simply fill in our very open-ended and very vague <laughs> questionnaire. That's why it's a web-based inquiry and not uh, research. And that's what most of them, most of them said, that uh, they didn't have a lot of training in a formal sense. They didn't, what training they had, they didn't think was that important. When they became head of department, they had a series of questions that they quickly found weren't the right questions. Uh, the questions were, the initial questions were about budgets and uh, finances and work allocation models and so on and so forth, the mechanisms. And actually the questions they should have been asking were different questions about people and how to handle uh, people and sensitivities and, and so on. Um, and yes, that what worked in one place in Canada, for example, didn't, uh, they had to learn a new, a new way of behaving in another place. So whatever that book's called, it's, it's, it's disgusting. <laughs> Teaching and Learning Development Center in Lund. Uh, people have been working with the uh, course development for individual teachers, <coughs> the development of departments or faculties and faculties. And uh, more and more, I think at least, we are also involved in the strategic work at the university mm. as uh, staff at the unit. And to some extent, I think it's reflected in the courses also. But from your experience, and I know that this is a general trend, it's not only mm -hmm. here, it's mm -hmm. uh, the same at different places in Sweden, and it's also an international trend. Mm -hmm. So what's your experience? Does this, is this reflected in courses in many places, or that also the teachers are prepared to be part of the strategic work in the Oh, committees, uh, evaluation committees. Uh, uh, as, uh, no, it's uh, no, not in the UK. Deans, vice rectors, or whatever. Yeah, that's interesting. No, we haven't seen that. I mean, the argument I've made would suggest that you're, that's the right thing to do, but not, not to my knowledge in the UK. No, I don't think so. Uh, there isn't that kind of. There's a focus on the teaching and learning practices and so on in quite a narrow way, and not thinking about the broader, uh, the broader role. 
Uh, there tends to be, a, I think, a, an aspect of courses about the higher education context, but they tend to be quite, from what I've seen of them, quite nebulous, really. You know, the massification and so on, rather than the detail of the learning architecture and how to be involved with it and how it works. It's exactly the same detail. Uh, one day you're the teacher, and then some day yeah. later. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a, yeah, no, we don't, I don't think we do that. One comments, questions? I think they want coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, please. Once again, thank you for the interesting oh. <laughs> setting for our coming discussions. And this is some uh, souvenirs, local souvenirs. Oh, thank you very much indeed. Christmas oh. souvenirs. <laughs> <laughs> thank you indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.